Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 18. That won't be the first verse that I'll read, but that will be our primary text tonight. Acts chapter 18. If you're visiting tonight, I'm a visitor like you. Glad that you, you have found us. Glad that you're here. Hope that you have brought a Bible. Or if not, I'll have some of the verses on the screen, but glad that you're willing to spend part of your evening with us. Hope that you've already been welcomed, and more importantly, or equally importantly, uh, that, that you'll see where our focus is, where our hope is, and the God whom we serve, who brings us together tonight. Uh, to the church here, uh, in a, could, could take much more time, but in the simplest of ways for now, let me thank you again for the opportunity to, to share in the work with you for a few days as you have share the past five years with my family in many ways. Uh, as Brendan said, my, my, it's been a, a, a treat and a pleasure for my, my children to get to know some of your children. Uh, for Starla and I, get to know some of, of you more personally, to know some of your sorrows and some of your joys, and just for a, a short time to, to share in those and, and pray in those things and trust that God knows what you need and will provide for that day by day as we... Uh, study tonight, a subject that is primarily about the home. I want to, uh, if you hear that lesson and think, well, this probably is not going to be a lesson for me, I hope that you'll, you'll stay with me uh, and trust whether you uh, are not married or long since married or shortly married or no longer married for whatever reason. I think there will be something here that will help uh, you influence others who are married, even if you are not. And, and so I... Uh, I uh, hope you'll study that and we'll all find some benefit from the things that God has spoken. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7 says, Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. There are a host of lessons uh, from this verse, but tonight we're going to key in on that phrase, as being heirs together of the grace of life. Of course, to be an heir uh, implies that you belong to someone. And so one must be a child of God in order to be an heir of the grace of life. And in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and following, Paul says that we are all children of God by faith, for as many of us as were baptized into Christ have, been, have put on Christ. And so who, who is an heir of life? What well, is those who having that faith, faith in the, in the working of God, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, have received the gift and the grace of God's forgiveness. And so I, I think that's who he is referring to here when he speaks of the grace of life. Who is it that, that you think of, maybe when you read this verse, and you think about a man and a woman, a husband and wife, and what you know of them, what you've observed from them and in them, you say that that is a couple who are truly heirs together of the grace of life. I hope you have someone, whether it was parents or grandparents or maybe not any of a physical relation. And I'm certain there are people here that, that you can look to if you're younger. And if you're older, uh, good for you to know there are others who notice, who notice that. Among the people, though, that we could count among that number of people that we would, would look to and view as heirs together of the grace of life, I believe, are Aquila and Priscilla, kind of like Sergius Paulus. Uh, these are a few of the, the lesser known people. They didn't write any letters uh, that are preserved and, and put in Scripture, but God preserved their names by putting them into Scripture. And though the details that we know about their marriage and their faith are few, uh, if you'll study with me, I think tonight we'll find uh, great, great lessons to learn and to live by. What would it be that would have made Aquila and Priscilla heirs together? Read with me Acts chapter 18, and let's just read verses 1 through 3 to get our introduction to them. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. 
And I think that implies not only, we know of course that Paul was a tent maker, but that uh, I think this is saying that both Aquila and his wife Priscilla were engaged in the work of a tent maker. And so uh, based on that idea, I want to for the moment now focus on Aquila and Priscilla. It sounds like they had a, 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 uh, a personal business and that they were business partners in the work of making tents. They were heirs together in part because they learned how to work together in physical things. Though, of course, our mind is set on things above, and that's where our heart needs to be, uh, not laying up treasures on earth, but that's, that's a part of living on this earth, is physical things. And so think with me for a few minutes about how, two, how a, a husband and wife who are heirs together of the grace of life, how they work together in physical things. It's no secret that, at least in our culture, I've, been, I've heard for years that money, money and money problems and complications uh, are the number one cause for divorce in our nation. But of course, there's many other causes. Sometimes it can be the stress that comes from the events of life. Sometimes the tragedies, sickness, some conflict or one another, uh, some other reason has destroyed homes because in those homes there were not two people and sometimes there was at least one person trying, but there were not two people who learned how to work together in the physical, in the earthly things that go into the relationship of marriage. So Aquila and Priscilla had somehow learned that, and I wish I knew more about, uh, more details about how their home worked and how they functioned together and shared that work together. And yet without those details, I think from the information we have, we could safely conclude that they learned how to communicate. Uh, they learned how to let each other know what was being done or what needed to be done. They could not have succeeded uh, in the task of tent makers without doing that. Uh, think about, of course, the necessity of decision making in the process of, of, of a marriage and of a business, and especially when your business partner is also your spouse. Tasks have to be divided. Uh, duties have to be divided and how much time someone has to do one or the other and when the circumstances of life change and some of that has to be passed off and handed off if one partner assumes or the other spouse assumes the, the, that's that's going to fall apart whether the business falls apart or the relationship begins to crumble or have cracks in it in some ways that, that's the part a uh, part of the nature of this life and of working together in physical things Maybe you've been at a job where the, the communication from the bottom up or from the top down was just ineffective. And so that, that relationship, the, even in the dollars and cents part, it just can't work effectively and efficiently if it doesn't matter who's on the top or the bottom, if that communication is not consistent and clear. Of course, God is the one who decided that husbands would be the head of the wife instructed them to, to love her as Christ loved the church, and that wives would submit to their husbands as the church does to Christ. But that doesn't negate the fact that the husband uh, needs to communicate with his wife the direction and the expectations and, and how, how that needs to work and how they can go. <clears throat> Any husband who thinks that he's like Christ, that he has all of the knowledge and all of the wisdom and he doesn't need, uh, need her input, has not understood Ephesians chapter 5 and does not really understand how two people work together in any relationship. Christ is not even that kind of a head. How many things, Jesus, there are certain things that Jesus has specified and required, but how many judgments can you think of where God spoke, where Jesus spoke, and He was just general? And He left some of those decisions up to His church, up to His people to work through on an individual basis. I would probably say that he spoke generally more often than he did specifically. But that doesn't negate the fact that he is the head of the church. Of course he is. But those who are his people, he has some degree of trust in us. That based on what he has said and what he has done and what we can know of him, then there's some decisions that he can leave, us, that he can leave it up to us to make, that he can trust us to make. And he's clearly communicated that. And so those who are heirs together can make decisions together. As the husband leads and as the wives submit, that, that, 
that is not a, a closed door decision making process. And every husband uh, who has learned what true leadership is uh, understands that. Budget decisions, career decisions, what is going to be done and where we're going to do it and where we're going to go, how much we're going to give for the church's work, how much we're going to give on some private individual basis, how much we need to save for this or that. All of that needs to be done together. The whole process and life, of course, is a series of decisions, isn't it? There are changes that come. And, the, and notice in verse 2, did you notice that change that Aquila and Priscilla were having to deal with? They, they were from Rome, but they had been forced by the government to leave Rome, and so that was why they found themselves in Corinth, uh, where, where Paul came. Imagine for a moment, I'm not trying to add to the Scripture, but just try to imagine for a minute, here this family has had to, to leave, I don't know why they were in Rome, but they had to leave that for this reason that, that was not really their responsibility. But what a stressful time for that. And what if Aquila and Priscilla cannot, for some reason, or, or do not, choose not, to communicate during this time? What if Aquila doesn't listen to, is not interested in what Priscilla's fears may be? What if he doesn't take into consideration at all her thoughts about where they're going to go as they're being forced to leave Rome? That, that's going to be a hindrance between them. What if Priscilla is too busy with the work or with friends or with her, her roots and her attachments to Rome to pay attention to the, the questions and the struggles uh, that, that her husband could have? But on the other side of that, if this forced relocation, if in the course of that process and this change and, and the strains that go with it, if he can talk to her and he can listen to her, if she can talk to him and she can listen to him, then they can navigate this particular stressful season of life. And it appears that they did so. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the longer that I live, I'm 47 years old, the longer that I live, that, that section of to everything there is a season, a time for every person, purpose under heaven, a time and a time for... Remember those verses. That, that section becomes richer and richer to me as, as I navigate the various changes that come in life, some of which we choose and some of which we do not choose. Uh, what, what will you say, husbands, to your wives when the time comes for one to be born? When the time comes to die, when the time comes to build up, when the time comes to tear down. Husbands, how you communicate what you say, what you don't say, matters if you want to be an heir of the grace of life with her. And wives, likewise, just read through Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, and I think that you'll be able to pick out some of the times you have gone through. And maybe some of the times that you're in, and you'll see some things maybe you have not navigated through yet. But that, that text is rich in consideration of some of the applications of what we're studying tonight. Wives, what you say and what you don't say to your husband in, in those seasons are a part of what will bring you closer together and help to make you heirs of life, even in the things that are temporary and of this world. Aquila and Priscilla appear also to, to work together in physical things in regards to the priorities that they have. And again, we, we don't have a, a ledger of, of their budget, but again, just by virtue of the fact that they were tent makers, uh, well, that, that was clearly, I think we see, not their first and most important priority. They were not first and most concerned with being the, the best tent makers in Rome, although they, they might have been, but that just wasn't their primary career goal. I read in some sports headlines a few weeks ago, there was a baseball player that was kind of being, according to the headline and the article, criticized because he said, baseball is not my top priority. And he is making, like many of them, millions and millions of dollars. And as I read the story, what he actually said was, well, my faith and my family is more important than baseball. And the particular person who was writing gave a little bit of attention to that, but he really just went on to say, you know, how, how good could he be if baseball was his top priority? And that, it, was, it was well said uh, by, by the, the player, not so much the, the author of the article. 
But more importantly, what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That, that appears to be what Aquila and Priscilla understood in the business-related and physical-related decisions that they had to make. Jesus spoke of the, the thorny ground in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 22, that there are those whom Satan will, will seek to erode their faith little by little, maybe not so much by making their life hard and difficult by tribulation or persecution, but maybe by getting them to pursue the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and, and the pleasures of life, as Luke adds in his record of that parable. Now, if, if Priscilla had one set of, of priorities in physical things, and Aquila had another set of priority in physical things, just, just in their business alone, that, that is not going to work well, even if they weren't married. Uh, but of course, in their marriage, without the same focus and priorities, think of all the problems that, that will arise. There, that, that's the way that debt happens in a family. That the husband and wife don't have the same set of priorities in, in, in regards to money. As a result of a different set of priorities, one is focused on the bottom line and work, working far beyond simply trying to provide for the basic needs of the family. As a result, the family becomes neglected. And one spouse notices that, and another spouse maybe doesn't. And so the conflict and the strife and the strain just grows and grows, and two cannot walk together if they are not agreed in the priorities of life. But on the positive side of that, if a husband and wife view the way that, that the reason for working and the reason for what they have and, and how it ought to be used, if they think of those things uh, the same way, if the, their, the way that they're viewed in the community because of their success is not of utmost importance to both of them, if physical possessions are low on the list of priorities, then that, that's a family that can flourish. That is a home of people working together in physical things. To you who are not married, this is why you are wise to search for and to marry not only a Christian, starting with a Christian, but someone who, who is a strong Christian, someone who is not, not carried and weighed down with the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches. Look for someone with whom you can work together in physical things. Aquila and Priscilla seem to have somehow learned that and demonstrated that, and therefore were heirs together. In Acts chapter 18, as Paul spends a little bit of time with them there in Corinth, when it, the time comes that he believes he needs to leave, it's interesting, and it's just briefly mentioned in verse 18, that Priscilla and Aquila were with him. So they had been forced to leave Rome and come to Corinth, so they didn't have roots there. And so uh, another great unknown part of the story we don't know is that not only did Paul stay with them, but they became very close, so much so that when, when he decided to leave, they said, okay, we're, we're going to go with you as well. And so left from Corinth, and then they went towards Ephesus. Paul spent some amount of time in Ephesus, but then he returned to Antioch, which is a theme of his work in the book of Acts. Uh, but they were not so tied to Paul that they just followed him everywhere. And so for some reason, they decided to stay in Ephesus while Paul returned to Antioch. And that's of importance because in ver beginning in verse 24, do you remember Apollos? We're introduced to him as an eloquent man, mighty in the Scriptures. He had come to Alexandria and he was teaching mightily the word of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. And that's where Aquila, uh, Luke, Luke pauses and mentions Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, I want to stop there for a minute and read with me verse 26. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. I don't necessarily want to focus on uh, the baptism subject, the baptism of John and the baptism of Christ tonight, I just want you to notice a husband and wife here and how they're working together in spiritual things. First of all, they are present together at a synagogue. Why would 
a Christian, be at a synagogue. Well, it could be to continue learning the Old Testament scriptures that were being taught on that occasion. It could have just been out of that interest. Of course, they were not going to the synagogue, presenting themselves as being in full fellowship with the Jews there. But you, there might be someone visiting here tonight. You, you don't know what we teach or don't believe the things that are being taught here. You're welcomed. And so you can come from that perspective. You, you can, uh, as a Christian, we might go visit some religious group and we know we don't believe what they, what they teach. But we can have a variety of reasons to go and sit and listen and so maybe Aquila and Priscilla went for that reason, just to listen to the teaching from the Old Testament. Uh, they could have been going, looking for an opportunity to teach someone, to meet someone in order to teach. We know on a few occasions, visitors to the synagogue would be given an opportunity to speak. Uh, Paul was given that opportunity on a few occasions. So maybe uh, Aquila expected that kind of an opportunity. I, I don't know exactly what it was, but... Consider for a minute that they, they had work to do. Uh, they, they were tent makers. They, they had to, to do that. So they, they took a break from working together in physical things. And notice it wasn't that Aquila went and he left Priscilla home to make the tents. It wasn't that Priscilla went to the synagogue and, and Aquila stayed home to build the tents. They, they both went to the synagogue. They both went together. They, they were not idle. Uh, they were not even, of course, required to be there. So while I don't know exactly why they went, uh, I think we're seeing here, uh, again, what, what mindset they shared together. Did they go to the synagogue because they just had not, nothing else to do? Uh, I've been told there was a time in our society when a gospel meeting like this would be filled with people, and some people who would just kind of come for the, the entertainment value, so to speak, because there was a day and a time where people didn't have a whole lot of private uh, entertainment in, in their own home. And so it was a, a social gathering of the community. And so people from the community who didn't typically worship together or even share a lot of the same convictions, they would see each other and meet together, uh, meet each other in the community at various occasions like this. Was that the case with Aquila and Priscilla? They just didn't have the iPad and, and, and internet connection, and so they said, well, we don't have anything better to do. Let's just go to the synagogue tonight. Uh, let me give you just a, a few historical notes to show you that was not the case. People back then may not have had iPads and the, the internet, but people in the Roman Empire had plenty of things to do. If you lived in a town that had it, you could go to a seaside villa. There were cabins and people could go and uh, see shore colonies. There were beautiful beaches. There were beautiful places. There were mountains and uh, pl plenty of places to go. Quill and Priscilla could just have had a, a, a night away together for some other reason. They could have gone to the theater. Did you know they had theaters back then? It, of course, wasn't on a screen. It would have all have been live. But there, there were places such as that. And even in Ephesus, where they are at this point, Ephesus, uh, I think this, yeah, this, this is the theater, the picture here is a theater in Ephesus where these events are occurring. Why did they go to the synagogue and not to the theater? Did you know that libraries were not the invention of Americans? There were libraries back then, and there, if I, my memory serves me correct, there was a library in Ephesus. So why didn't they go down to the public library and just sit and read for a little bit instead of going to that, that synagogue? Uh, are, are there any fanatics here tonight, sometimes called fans, sports fans? There, there were sports back then. Of course, Americans didn't invent sports. They had, they had expensive, extravagant arenas, and, and so plenty of opportunities for people who enjoyed that. And of course, our modern Olympic Games came from events in other cultures and other times. They had all kinds of resorts. Did you know that? You could go to, to places along the water or places where there were, notice this, running tracks, covered walks, planted gardens, reading rooms. Does that sound appealing to you? Maybe you and your wife would like to go spend a few days or a week doing that. There, there can be some time to do that. But you see my point here. Aquila and Priscilla had plenty of other things to do. They, they're in Ephesus, and before when they were in Corinth, and before when they were in Rome. 
the part of the world that they were said to have lived in were full of opportunities for these types of things. But where are Aquila and Priscilla when they didn't even have to be? Where were they? They were in the synagogue listening to an out-of-town speaker uh, speak concerning the Scriptures. And both of them were there together. That tells us something about this man and this woman, heirs together of the grace of life. But of course, just showing up together is is a, a part of it. But they're both listening together. They're listening carefully enough so that when they hear this man Apollos, and I'm sure that they were impressed by what they heard from him, but at some point, uh, I sort of imagine they, they looked at each other as he began to talk about baptism, and then as he began to explain about the role of, of John, they might have elbowed each other and maybe whispered to each other politely and respectfully, did, did, did he say what I thought he said? They listened together, attentive to what was being said, You remember the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11? They searched the Scriptures daily whether these things were so. That's that's what they were doing. They, They had that same mindset. They were able to discern both truth from error. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14. They were knowledgeable enough to listen and to analyze what they heard and know how to respond to it. I wonder how they developed that that ability to discern both good and evil. Back to Acts chapter 18 and verse 3, who who was that roommate that they had for a short amount of time? The Apostle Paul. Again, doesn't Luke just often give us just enough information uh, to to light the wick of our imagination? Uh, I wonder what they sat and talked about. Uh, with, with Paul, maybe they sat side by, side by side making tents, and maybe Paul shared a few tent making tips with them, and maybe he with them. Maybe one or both of them became better tent makers because they were together. But I think they became better something else because of being together. And what, what would you have done if you had the opportunity to host the Apostle Paul? Uh, I, I don't know if they did, but I, sp- I suppose they were just shotgunning him with questions. And they learned and they grew, and, and yet they, they were not dependent upon him. Because here he is, he, he's, he's long gone. He's headed back to Antioch, but they've learned from him to discern both good and evil. And of course, the, the result of that was to the benefit of Apollos and of all the brethren who benefited from him. Time spent together husbands and wives who make time to be together for any reason, probably good. Husbands and wives who make time to spend together, being together, listening together. Things like this show they are at least beginning to understand what it means to work together in spiritual things. Heirs together of the grace of life. But then they didn't just walk out the door of the synagogue and, well, that, that's, that's too bad that he taught such a thing. That's, that's a shame that he hasn't learned about the baptism of Christ. Paul told us that. Too bad he, he didn't teach that. Uh, this, this took another level of courage, I think we could all see, especially in light of what Luke tells us. Apollos was an eloquent man, mighty in the Scriptures, clearly knowledgeable, clearly talented. And then uh, here are... A man and woman, we we might say they appear to be more blue-collar workers, and Apollos seems to be more white-collar, educated. Uh, Alexandria was a a place of great education. And yet the the blue-collar couple isn't afraid to go to talk to the highly educated white-collar man and and ask him a few questions, take him aside and explain the way of God to him more accurately. Here's a husband and wife working together, I would assume that that would have, could have been a little bit intimidating for them, especially if they had been there alone. But maybe, maybe it was a little bit easier for them to take him aside because two were there instead of just one. Another passage that, that grows in application, though it's, it's, it's short, but still fairly well known, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. You remember two are better 
than one. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And then Solomon gives several examples and illustrations of that point. But think about how much more husbands and wives can do when they do things together. I think Aquila and Priscilla are an excellent example of that. Uh, Husbands and wives tonight, think about what more you might could do if you and your spouse were doing more together. Would, Would you pray more regularly if you prayed together? Would you be more aware of the needs of the sick if you talked to each other about who that was? making time to visit those who are sick and those who are shut in? Would would you be more prepared for a Bible class here or on some other occasion if you made time to do that together? Would you open your home more often if you talked about that and the benefits of that, whether it's for a Bible study or for a meal or desserts? Just open your home, another opportunity for people, for brethren to be together. Could, Could you do that more often or more effectively? if you and your husband or you and your wife did those things together. And if you're looking for a spouse, uh, be patient. I I was 33 years old when uh, Starla and I married, and so I spent all of my 20s uh, seeing my friends marry and and enjoying being around friends of my, peers of mine who were married, and then going home by myself that night. But it, it is worth the wait. If you're looking for a spouse, patiently wait until you find someone that you can labor together with in these ways. Two are better than one, Solomon says. But if you read, the, his point is, if they both are intent on working together, uh, two is not better than one if, they, if they're divided in their priorities and their goals. And so if, if it's hard to do some of these things while you're alone... I can tell you, and you can understand, it would be more difficult to do them if you were with someone who was not with you in the goals and the priorities of such things. And so wait for someone who will be an heir together with you. Aquila and Priscilla show us how how valuable and effective two are. And then last, how's... Aquila and Priscilla were heirs together of the grace of life because they demonstrated hospitality. Of course, that word hospitality means a love of strangers, but it goes beyond just strangers. Peter said in 1 Peter uh, I think chapter 4, verse 9, to be hospitable to one another. So it's not limited to those, though it can certainly include generosity towards those that we don't know well. And you have, the church here has certainly demonstrated that towards my family this week, but, but it encompasses so much more than that. Uh, I've heard from people who know far more than I do that, that the, the construction of homes in America reflects uh, less and less interest in hospitality, that there's more of a focus on the man cave and upon the television screen and, and that gaining the attention of the guest instead of a table or instead of a, of a layout that, that encourages Uh, actual conversation between guests. I think that is a a definite challenge that we face today that maybe in the past it it was a a part of so-called southern hospitality, uh, but of course not limited to that, but but as a whole our culture uh, moving away from uh, from genuine interest in other people spent in our homes. There may be a variety of reasons for that, You know, hospitality is an imposition on us. It imposes on our privacy. We all have different personalities and prefer varying degrees of of private time. There's a need for that and there's a place for that. Even Jesus, in Matthew chapter 14, he, He wanted some time to Himself. He craved, to some degree, time to Himself. But there are at least a few occasions, Mark, Matthew chapter 14 being one of them, when he was off by himself, and then the crowds found him, and he, he couldn't turn them away. He had compassion and gave up at least some of that private time in order to meet the needs that, that he saw to be urgent. And so if, if you're more of an introvert, and it's, it's more of a challenge uh, to, to have people either into your home or to, to give up some of that kind of time, would you be willing to surrender some of your preferences 
uh, if, if Jesus were the guest? Well, of course, there would be an open door policy for Jesus. And so remember his words that as you do those things unto these, the, the least of my brethren, uh, you have done them to me. It, it's worth being imposed on our privacy, isn't it? Also notice that this is a need that God decided the local churches would not meet, but that God decided the local disciples would meet. That from house to house, the, need, the needs that hospitality meets would be provided by the home, by the family, and not by the budget and the facilities of the church, what, whatever facilities those may have been. And so it's sad that brethren are often separated from one another because even churches claiming to be of Christ, hosting sports events and meals and camps, and there, there's just no end to the list of things which are innocent in and of themselves, all of which can be hosted and provided for by disciples who are interested. And I'm thankful that the church here has that kind of a conviction, not only to not participate and sponsor such events, but that privately you enjoy being together and you open your homes and you open your schedule even on short notice as you have it with me this week. That, that is so important. And that is a, a, a protection in a sense uh, to provide for each of us the things that are needed. Hospitality imposes upon our time. And yet Ephesians 5 and verse 16 says to redeem the time. Make the most of the time. Our time is limited. And so what, what will, we, will we do with it? Well, Aquila and Priscilla had the same basic demands on, on their time that I do and that you do. And yet they, they found a way and they made time. And we all do that. We make time for the things that are, are most important to us or maybe the things that on the surface might not be as important to us. But if we know they are of great importance to God, then we make time for those things. I think you're here tonight for that reason. And so let's, let's apply that same principle in a variety of other ways, and even energy. And I, I just mentioned this uh, for the purpose of, of encouraging you, uh, even to the sense that maybe you can't open your home uh, because of, of health limitations or other. Uh, yes, uh, hospitality imposes on that. We all have differing abilities and agrees, uh, degrees in what we're able to do. If you just don't have the physical strength, then, then find someone who does and, and work together with them. Maybe your house can't provide for that, but someone else's can, and, and you can lift some burden. You can go to their house and help them prepare. This is just the nature of Christians working together, either as husband and wife or otherwise. But whatever the cost may be, uh, is, is it worth the cost of our privacy, giving up some privacy and giving up some time and giving up some energy? Well, of course it's worth it. It is more because it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do we, uh, do we see that in Aquila and Priscilla? Uh, of course. And we can see that in our own lives as well. Well, how, did we, how do we see Aquila and Priscilla giving up their privacy and their time and even their energy? Well, we read already uh, the, them opening their home in Acts 18, 2 and 3 towards Paul. And again, for a moment, consider, if, consider that if Aquila or Priscilla, even just one of them, had objected, well, if, if uh, Priscilla had come home and said, well, I was buying some supplies uh, for our, our tent-making business, and I met this, this Christian named, named Paul, and he, he needs a place, and we're of the same occupation, and so I, I thought we, he could stay with us. We have a place. We have room. Uh, what if Aquila had objected? Or what if Priscilla had objected? Well, it's just not really convenient. We have a lot to do. And, and you know, I'm playing in that, that city softball league and, and uh, just not going to have time to, to, to host someone. We need our privacy. Think about all that they would have lost if they had not hosted uh, Paul there in Acts chapter 18 in the city of Corinth. It, it was worth the inconvenience and the sacrifice. And think about all that they gave and all that they received. They, they traveled with Paul in chapter 18 and verse 18, and of course they were not traveling in the kind of luxury that, that, that I had in order to get here. Travel was, was much more difficult back then. That was inconvenient, but they sowed and they certainly reaped. 
Think about what they gained from their association with Paul. And then think about the faith that they showed by maintaining their association with Paul. Uh, he, he mentions them in Romans chapter 16 in writing to the Romans. So remember, Aquila and Priscilla had come from Rome. And so sometime, and so on the occasion when Paul wrote to Rome, he said, he, he, uh, well, let me look at it. I've forgotten if he is sending greetings to or, or greetings from them. Sending greetings to Priscilla and Aquila. And so when you read the book of Romans, you know the, the challenging things that are there. We studied a few nights ago from Romans chapter 13. Paul wrote to the Romans about lewdness and lust and strife and envy and drunkenness and revelry. That, that might not have been popular among some in the church at Rome, but Aquila and Priscilla uh, were willing to stand by and to be known for their love for Paul. Aquila and Priscilla also stood by him in Corinth. What kind of a reputation did Paul have even among the church in Corinth? Well, he was loved, of course, initially. But when you read 1 Corinthians, when you read 2 Corinthians, some, uh, some criticized him in a variety of ways. And Aquila and Priscilla stood beside him and encouraged him so much so that Romans 16 in verse 3, he not only greets them, but he says in verse 4 that they risked their own necks for my life to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Uh, of course, we're, we're not told how or what the occasion was in which they risked their own lives for him. But just imagine, of course, Paul benefited from that, but my point is, they benefited from that. How do you think their faith grew as a willingness to stick their own necks out, their own lives out for Paul? And then apparently, obviously, God preserved their lives their faith grew, by, must have, by leaps and bounds. But what, what was the beginning of that? It was because they opened their home to Paul. My point of this is not that you just need to become best friends with Brendan and I. You've got, you've got to be best friends with the preacher. That, that is not the point. The point is the hospitality and look at all the benefits spiritually that Aquila and Priscilla gained because they opened their home to Paul and then even to some degree, in some way, they, they opened their home to the church. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 5, likewise greet the church that is in their home. Uh, that, I, I don't know exactly what that means, if, if that means just the, the, the parts of the church in their home, or if it means the church meeting in their home. I, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe some of you could answer that for me. But just consider briefly, if they, they were opening their home, hosting the church in that sense. If that were the case, can you imagine uh, if the congregation here, if you had facilities in your home to host the entire congregation week after week, can you imagine the, the crumbs that you might find on the floor that the children might leave after, after that gathering? Uh, the preparation week after week that that would require. And so, again, whether they were doing that for the, the church assembling in their home or whether their home was open to some portion of the church in some way. In either case, I think their reputation stands upon his own, its own. And then that's, that's also mentioned in something along that, that line is mentioned as Paul wrote to the Corinthians as well. And so they, they, they helped to benefit and strengthen the faith of many, but maybe the focus tonight is on think about how they, their faith was strengthened because a husband and a wife work together in spiritual things, work together in the ways that they could in regards to hospitality. Of course, we're not going to be judged on, uh, in the last day by the faith of our husband or the faith uh, of my wife. We're going to stand before God on our own. But it is also equally as certain that as a husband, I can greatly help and strengthen the faith of my wife. And as a wife, you can greatly help and strengthen the faith of your husband. And if there, and among the variety of ways that we could say how to do that, it is as Peter did in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. If you would be an heir together with him, if you would be an heir together with her, then you can influence to some degree the, the eternity of your spouse as well as others who can come under the influence of a man and a wife who are heirs together. 
Turn in your song books or turn your attention to the song that we're going to sing. If you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, uh, I hope you have a husband or, or wife who would help you in these things, but you need first to be an heir before you can be an heir together. If, there, if you have any questions about the needs of your soul, if you are here tonight and you know that you're lost because of your sin, uh, Jesus came to this earth not so much so that there could be husbands and wives, but so that there could be sinners forgiven of their sin. If you know that that's your need tonight, uh, we sing this song in part to urge you to, to accept the invitation of our Lord and of your God, Jesus Christ. He's willing to forgive you if you, based upon your faith, that He is the Son of God. If you're ready to leave your sin, if you're ready to confess your faith, if you'll be baptized in water, you'll be baptized into Christ and into His death. And if we can assist you by studying with you, we want to do that. But if, if you don't have any more questions tonight, but you're ready to live by faith, come forward and tell us how we could help you. As a Christian, if the life of Aquila and Priscilla have reminded you that you've neglected the faith in some way. Maybe you just need to pray to your God for forgiveness or for strength. But if our prayers will, will comfort and encourage you in any way, uh, we're not too busy to do that. And as Christians, let's sing this song with the joy and the hope that we have to live day by day by faith in Him. But if we could help you now in any way, please tell us how as we stand and sing. <laughs>